Dear colleagues and friends, welcome to the webinar on investment law reform, The View from Asia. My name is Stephanie Schachauer and I'm pleased to open the second session of our four-day webinar. The PowerPoint presentations and the recordings of our first session from yesterday are now available on the CIL website. Today's moderator is Dr. Romesh Veramantri. He is the head of international dispute resolution at CIL. Um, National University of Singapore. So without further delay, we will now begin the second session of the webinar. Um, over to you, Romesh. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Welcome to day two of the NUS Center for International Law and NYU US Asia Law Institute Conference on Investment Law Reform, The View from Asia. Yesterday, we were treated to an excellent discussion on the state of play in foreign investment reforms at international organizations. We heard about developments at ICSID, the Antitrial Working Group 3, UNCTAD, and the WTO. The wonderful presentations made yesterday has provided an ideal foundations for the topics we're about to discuss today. This session will look at government perspectives on reform the view from Asian capitals. Today, we're privileged to have with us four extremely expert and accomplished speakers from Singapore, South Korea, Vietnam, and India. Taking them in alphabetical order, we first have Professor Jamin Lee, a professor of law at Seoul National University, who has been participating in anti-trial working groups two and three since 2012, as a delegate of South Korea. He previously worked for the Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs in a number of roles, including as Deputy Director of the Treaties Division and the North American Trade Division. Next, we have Natalie Morris Sharma, a Government Legal Counsel with Singapore's Attorney General's Chambers, in which capacity she advises on matters affecting public international law obligations of Singapore. She currently serves as the Rapporteur for Antitrial Working Group 3 on ISDS reform, and previously was the Chairperson of the Antitrial Working Group that developed the Singapore Mediation Convention. Next, I'd like to introduce Pramod Nair. Pramod is an advocate and arbitrator at Arista Chambers, which he founded. He represents the Government of India in investor state arbitrations, and has also represented India at the United Nations. Our fourth speaker is Quinn Vu, who is Deputy Director of the Department of Legislation at the Vietnamese Ministry of Planning and Investment. In this role, she's been participating in negotiations and implementation of bilateral investment treaties and investment chapters in free trade agreements. She's also acted as a government lawyer in investor state disputes involving Vietnam and has participated in drafting of laws and regulations on business and investment, including Vietnam's law on investment in 2020 and its implementing regulations. So as you can see, we have a fantastic array of speakers and I now turn to the topics uh, that we will discuss. Stephanie, could you just please change the slide? So the topics will So the topics that we are going to deal with today um, essentially were covered yesterday. Um, and if you could just change the next slide. So essentially we're going to talk um, about um, the current re exit reforms then the Antitrial Working Group 3, the WT negotiations on a multilateral framework for investment facilitation, recent approaches to bilateral and regional treaty making, 
And finally, we'll have a look at uh, Asian approaches to investment law reforms. At the end of the session, we will reserve some time for questions and answers. So please feel free uh, to ask those uh, whenever you feel uh, it's necessary. Okay, so <clears throat> now to the topics. <clears throat> we'll start, as I said, with ICSID reforms. Um, <clears throat> now, yesterday you heard Meg Kinnear speak about uh, the ICSID reforms. She was saying that working paper number five is almost ready. Um, so we're close to the end of that reform process. Um, <clears throat> the reforms looked at time and costs of arbitration, third party funding, security for costs, uh, the new ICSID mediation rules, and a code for arbitrators. And all of these essentially are addressing some of the issues and the criticisms that have been leveled at investment arbitration. <clears throat> now, first of all, I'd like to go to Pramod, because interestingly, Pramod is from India, uh, and India is not a, uh, an ICSID convention party. But I was wondering what... Uh, uh, from uh, Pramod's view and uh, uh, what India sees in the ICSID reform process. And also it'd be interesting to hear from his experience as counsel uh, representing India in these cases. Uh, Pramod? Thank you, Ramesh. Um, uh, let me, if I may, uh, start with a caveat. Um, I, I'm not speaking as a representative of the Indian government. Uh, I'm not part of the government in any capacity. So nothing I say today should be construed as being the official or the unofficial position of the Indian government. Uh, but what I hope to do is to, to provide uh, at least a moderately informed view of India's concerns in relation to ISDS disputes and what India hopes to achieve through the various ISDS reform initiatives that are currently underway. Uh, so, so with that uh, caveat, uh, if I could proceed to respond to your question, Ramesh. Um, as you mentioned uh, very correctly, India is not a party to ICSID. And uh, that was also a bit strange because India did participate quite actively in the ICSID convention negotiations, but it eventually chose not to sign up to the convention. Uh, whilst the reasons for India not joining ICSID have not been formally spelt out by uh, the government of India, a, a key concern seems to have been with automatic enforcement of ICSID awards. And India has been much more comfortable with the New York Convention, which has built in exceptions to the enforcement of arbitral awards. Uh, however, with the various reforms to the ICSID rules that have happened since 1965 and the new ones that are currently being discussed, uh, and as India's engagement with ISD has, ISDS has deepened over the years, uh, I would imagine that India would sooner or later rethink its position in relation to acceding to the ICSID Convention. Uh, in, in particular, a few of the proposed reforms that are currently being considered to the ICSID rules and as flagged up in the recent working papers uh, would be of particular interest to India. Uh, Ramesh, you mentioned regulation of third party funding, uh, and that is uh, an issue that is at the core of the ICSID amendment process. Uh, there have been fairly widespread concerns across states, uh, India included. Uh, about the impact of third party funding arrangements on arbitral proceedings. Uh, this includes concerns about the risk that any non-disclosure of such arrangements could potentially mask uh, conflicts of interest for arbitrators or others who are involved in such arbitrations, as well as more practical issues related to the potential inability of a funded claimant to satisfy costs award should it prove to be unsuccessful in the proceedings. Uh, in, in this background, uh, greater and mandatory disclosure of, of, uh, of uh, information about third party funding in individual cases is likely to be considered as a welcome development by India. Uh, second, uh, in relation to the proposed disclosure or greater levels of disclosure of corporate structures, the ICSID reform process is considering amendments to the process and requirements governing the submission by claimants of their request for arbitration. States have been pushing for greater disclosures of corporate structures by claimants. And it's quite often that when uh, red fund schedules are exchanged uh, in the context of any ongoing proceeding, uh, there is a, 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 a clear uh, preference for states to ask for as much information as they can 
about the corporate structure of, of, of claimants. Uh, whilst uh, at one level, it would assist the parties and any appointing authorities in identifying uh, potential arbitrators who are free from any conflicts of interest, I think it could also be very useful in developing tools to address parallel proceedings by related corporate entities, which has been a particularly controversial issue in recent ISDS cases. Uh, this is again a matter of special interest for India, which has faced multiple claims on essentially the same cause of action from related uh, corporate entities. And there are of course various other soft law uh, 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 initiatives uh, in relation to addressing this issue of parallel proceedings in the context of ISDS claims. So, uh, you know, I think uh, th these are uh, areas that I would think uh, the decision makers in India would be looking at very closely in relation to the ICSID initiatives, but I don't think India has particularly been active in engaging with the reform discussions that is currently underway at ICSID. Thanks, Pramod. That's uh, perfectly understood that um, <clears throat> You know, India is not a party to exit convention. Um, the same with Vietnam. And I, I'm just wondering if, uh, Quinn, did you have any comments on, on the Vietnamese position and, and what Vietnam is sort of uh, doing in relation to what's happening at exit? Uh, thank you, Romesh. First of all, I would like to express my sincere um, thanks to the CIA at the National University of Singapore for providing me this opportunity to participate in the webinar. Uh, as Romes has mentioned previously, Vietnam is not a member of the EXIT convention and uh, similar to the reason has been cited by uh, our colleague from India. Uh, one of the reason uh, is the need to amend domestic law to enable the enforcement of EXIT award the automatic mechanism. Um, however, Vietnam has just ratified the EU-Vietnam Investment Protection Agreement with similar enforcement mechanism, and I hope that Vietnam will join the EXIT Convention soon. Um, even though Vietnam is not a member of the EXIT Convention, we still follow the discussion on EXIT rules uh, amendment very closely, because we understand that even though we are not a member of EXIT, the additional facility rules still apply to us in case the investor opt to submit the case to arbitration tribunal under exit additional facility rules. And um, at the same time, the exit rules amendment can affect uh, the way we conduct our um, uh, ISDS case, even though it is um, um, considered under or uh, exit additional facility rules or ancestral rules. Uh, for example, we can uh, base on the, the proposal in amending exit rules with regards to um, third party funding, we will try to, to fight for the disclosure of third party funding in our um, procedural order when there is a uh, as yes, guys, uh, that is one of the reasons. Uh, we, uh, with regards to the form of participation in uh, exit the amend, uh, amending this, um, the amendment of exit rules, uh, we also participate in the official meetings of exit members uh, as an observer. Uh, we also participate in an official online webinar like. Um, um, many webinar with regards to the um, the adoption of um, of um, um, code of conduct for the adjudicator. Uh, with regards to the discussion under exit uh, rules amendment, we are inspired by the development in areas such, uh, of great importance for us, such as third party funding, security for cost the opt-in mechanism for expedited procedure. Uh, and uh, we also understand the difficulties that the discussion ha uh, uh, have because the, the party have to balance the divergent views of countries that are members of the discussion. Well, thank you. Thanks, Queen. It's very interesting that even though Vietnam's not a party, it's, it's so in involved and, and, and observing uh, the process and great to hear that uh, there was some interest in Vietnam joining the exit convention. 
Um, so th that's very interesting to hear. Um, uh, so um, if now I could join uh, to, to move to the two states um, represented here that are members of the ICSID, let's first turn to Jay Min. Um, what's the South Korea position on, on the current reforms? Thank you. Uh, good evening and good morning. Thank you very much, Ramesh. It's a great honor to be on this panel. I'd like to thank uh, CIL and uh, USA, USA Ally for organizing this great event. Uh, obviously, I'm also speaking from my personal capacity. And uh, uh, as you just mentioned, Ramesh, uh, the Exceed Rules Amendment uh, is very important development. And uh, South Korea is participating in the negotiation and discussion of the reform. Uh, and the amendment of the rules uh, very actively uh, since 2016, uh, in parallel with the uh, UNCITRAL discussions, which we'll, we will discuss later. So uh, the, the, the attention to the investment arbitration, as with any other country, uh, has been uh, on the rise in, in South Korea since about 10 years ago, uh, due to many different factors. Uh, and obviously, uh, the attention is also directed to the procedures in the ICSID and ICSID rules. Uh, and uh, South Korea is also uh, seeing the increasing uh, attention and uh, the, the criticism and the suggestions for reform with respect to the ISDS uh, proceedings. And those uh, suggestions and concerns are now being discussed uh, in, the, uh, in the context of uh, ICSID uh, rules amendment. So the development in the ICSID rules amendment uh, is, uh, has been uh, grabbing the significant attention in, in South Korea, both in the governmental sector, as well as in the, the academic area as well. The way we see it, uh, the way we see the discussion in the ICSID, uh, for instance, uh, is perhaps summarized this way. Uh, the ICSID uh, the rules amendment discussion has been targeted uh, and confined to I would say to uh, uh, specific topics such as third party funding or a code of ethics or some specific topics that has been that have been garnered the uh, the consensus of uh, members of the ICSID. So that way uh, the discussion at ICSID has been uh, efficient uh, and targeted and uh, uh, very uh, robust for the past five years. So it seems that the discussion at the ICSID could result in some tangible results, tangible outcome in the near future. And in that regard, uh, the, the discussions at ICSID will provide uh, opportunity to address some of the major concerns, probably not all of them, but at least some of the outstanding concerns for many countries. Obviously, those concerns uh, of, of South Korea, as it experienced in the ISDS proceedings so far. So those uh, a couple of important concerns will be addressed by the ICSID rules amendment uh, in the near future. And I believe that will be a significant contribution to the improvement of uh, the rules of uh, ISDS proceedings. I like the term used in the ICSID rules amendment uh, discussion, which is the term modernize. So ICSID has been trying to modernize its important rules in ISDS proceedings, and that effort to modernize will uh, will provide uh, very tangible fruits uh, in the near future. So we will have to see how these things will be finalized in the near future. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Jamin. Um, uh, just one thing that both um, Quinn and Pramod mentioned, and this is not the ICSID reform, but I thought it was very interesting that the reason why they, you know, those two countries haven't really adopted the ICSID convention was the the, you know, the enforcement regime. Just wondering whether you had any views on in, in, in Korea that you've adopted that enforcement regime. Are there any sort of concerns about that where ICSID doesn't really give you uh, a right to, to raise, raise sort of objections to an enforcement process? Uh, well, uh, well, uh... The way we see the ICSID convention uh, is actually, uh, it is in uh, the, the ICSID regime and also the New York convention regime uh, uh, are complementary to each other. So uh, we believe for the full picture of uh, the ISDS proceedings and in international investment law, investment law mechanism, the, the combination of the two regime 
uh, is uh, more beneficial and uh, more rewarding in the long run. So many countries have different views, of course, uh, but uh, in, uh, from the perspective of Korea, uh, we, we do see the importance uh, in the exit regime, as well as uh, the, the New York Convention regime. We see them uh, the complementary to each other. Uh, very interesting. Um, now I'm going to move to, to Natalie, who's, you know, obviously she's, <clears throat> she knows some of the exit reforms for her work at the Antitrial Working Group. Uh, as Meg mentioned yesterday, the Code for Arbitrators was jointly drafted by exit and Antitrial. Um, but I was just wondering what, what uh, Natalie's uh, impression was from the uh, standpoint of Singapore on the ICSID reforms. Um, thanks very much, Ramesh. A good day to one and all. And thank you for, to the organizers for having me as part of this um, very informative and engaging event. Um, for Singapore, we are certainly very supportive of the ICSID reform initiative, and we've been participating actively as well in the, in the process since 2016. And we've been generally supportive of the direction in which ICSID has, has taken these reforms, as well as the manner in which they've conducted it very transparently, very efficiently. And in terms of the substance of the reforms, we've, we've been generally supportive of a number of them, voluntary consolidation, um, costs following the event. I think Meg mentioned yesterday, although working paper five is not yet available, um, the direction in which uh, it will take security for costs and third, third party funding is something that I think we would be ready to support. And of course, the fact that there will be new exit mediation rules that will be complemented by the Singapore Convention on Mediation is something that I'm sure we will be very ready to welcome. Um, as you mentioned, one of the processes that overlaps with UNSUTRAL is that of the code of conduct. And the fact that ICSID has worked closely with UNSUTRAL on this and, and UNSUTRAL with ICSID on this project, we think is something, uh, Singapore thinks, is, is something that is um, very appropriate and something to be applauded. The code of conduct issue is a point that Singapore has raised where fragmentation would not be helpful and harmonization would in fact be very, very useful. Um, we're not gonna benefit from a wide diversity of disclosure rules of, of conduct um, that mediators or arbitrators or adjudicators uh, should be following, but rather if we can have a standardized code applicable to all ISDS cases, whether or not they're taken up under the exit uh, convention uh, under the UNSATRAL arbitration rules or any other arbitration rules um, is something uh, that uh, is, is to be encouraged. Also, if it can be applied to any future institutions, they may come out of the UNSATRAL Working Group 3 process, which is certainly something that the code envisions. So this, this kind of flexibility in the harmonization exercise, just to use that word very broadly, is something that Singapore is also supportive of. And of course, in terms of content, our positions are well known. Uh, we've supported various aspects on the code of conduct, including the competency requirements, the disclosure requirements, um, confidentiality duties not to disclose, and for that continuing after the arbitral award has been um, rendered. So uh, I think that that gives just a kind of a few touch points on Singapore's participation, uh, the position that we've taken and our general support for the initiative and exit. Thank you, Natalie. So um, we'll wrap up there for the exit reforms. Obviously the process has gone on for a number of years since 2016, it's wrapping up now, and um, there seem to be results very close at hand. Um, and those results seem to be addressing these issues of cost, time, third party funding, all of the ones mentioned. And now we've got new uh, sort of new mediation provisions that may be used. So it seems like, it, you know, it's achieved a lot. Um, <clears throat> now, while Natalie is on, um, on the speaker uh, as, it, uh, as this format uh, uh, allows us. Um, I'll move now to the Antitrial Working Group and um, she's well known for being the rapporteur of the Working Group 3. Um, I just thought it would be helpful given her sort of intimate knowledge of Working Group 3 before she speaks about Singapore's position, if she could just give some comments about uh, Working Group 3 from the rapporteur's point of view. Um, certainly, I'm very happy to do so. I know the rapporteur's role uh, raises questions of mystique in many people's minds. Um, I assure you that it is not as uh, 
it's not as mysterious as it may seem. It, it's in, in, the, in the context of working group three, in addition to preparing, preparing reports, um, I'm involved in organizing and steering a number of the meetings together with the chair and the secretariat. What I would say from this process and observing it from the perspective of rapporteur is that the working group three project is certainly a very ambitious one, um, not just in terms of the number of issues that have been taken up. And I know that Janssen has given a, a, a very good summary of what the working group is looking into and where it stands right now. So I won't go into that. But I think what I will um, just mention, highlight uh, is are two points. Uh, first of all, that although we're drawing as much as possible, or at least the intention of delegations is to draw as much as possible from existing treaty practice, um, there is certainly going to be a lot, I think, that will come out of, the, of working group three that will chart new paths, um, not least in the area of ADR mechanisms and the encouragement of its use and whatever tools we may come up with in order to promote that, but also in the form of institutions. So right now there is an intercessional going on in a multilateral advisory center. And I'm sure our friends on the call would know that there is an appellate mechanism that's being discussed. And of course, the permanent investment court. Then on the other part, on the other aspect of it, procedural aspects, because of the number of issues, because of how new uh, the terrain is in many respects, um, we've had to work on a lot of new working methods, including an unprecedented reliance on informal sessions and intercessionals. And um, this has really, I think I wanted to take the opportunity here since our focus of this panel is on Asian governments. Um, what we've seen through this process, or at least what I personally observed, is that a lot of the Asian delegations that have been involved, they've not only been active, uh, but also very proactive. And of just a, one example of the two intersessional meetings that will be held this year under the auspices of UNCTRAL Working Group 3, both will be hosted by Asian states. So Hong Kong, China, as well as the Republic of Korea will be hosting intercessional events as part of the intercessional process. Um, so with that, that's just a brief comment on uh, the rapporteur's perspective as to just brand it that. Um, and I, I think uh, you've mentioned for me to get into some of Singapore's views on yes, the work please. of Working Group 3, which I'd be happy to do so. Um, so our, our main uh, views, I think I would, just uh, focus on three broad areas. Um, we've certainly supported, Singapore certainly supported the idea of ISDS reform. One of the concerns that has been identified has been in relation to costs and duration. And a number of things that we've supported have included how to better ensure that tribunals consider not just uh, the outcome, but also the manner in which parties conduct themselves during a dispute. Um, also, we have supported security for costs in order to deter frivolous and unmeritorious claims, especially on the part of impecunious investors or those who may be funded by third parties. In terms of the second area of uh, concerns that have been identified, consistency and correctness of arbitral decisions, Singapore supported an arbitration, uh, sorry, an app appellate mechanism. And uh, we think that this will be useful in enhancing correctness and enhancing consistency, just to use the terms of the working group and also echoing uh, what the terms that Janssen used yesterday. So enhancing correctness through uh, the appeal appellate process itself, but also through um, highlighting to first instance decision makers that their decisions will be subject or potentially subject to review. And in terms of enhancing consistency, uh, our position is a little bit more nuanced, not just consistency for consistency's stake, sake, but to the extent that it is possible, recognizing that there's a diversity of investment texts out there and also the different contexts in which these uh, texts and the disputes have developed. Um, of course, you need to manage the types of uh, appealable decisions, the scope of the review, the standard of review, in order to ensure that this additional layer does not worsen the issue of costs and duration. And I think this is something that the working group will need to further discuss, but it's a point that we have flagged a number of times in the course of the discussion. And just very quickly on the last point um, of selection and appointment of arbitrators, Singapore has spoken uh, and provided some suggestions, both in the context of selection and appointment for a permanent mechanism, as well as in the context of ad hoc ISDS. And for a permanent mechanism, very, very briefly, um, our position has been that we should have a uh, diverse avenues for nomination with eventual voting by states and possible renewable terms. And in terms of ad hoc ISDS, 
uh, we have drawn on our own treaty practice and suggested consideration, a further consideration of a roster of pre-selected arbitral tribunal members. Um, if, and if this is scaled internationally, perhaps an international institution could step in in terms of maintaining and running this roster and keeping it sustainable over the long term. So just a bit of a whirlwind tour of uh, Singapore's key points in the debate. Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, very, very interesting to hear both your uh, rapporteur uh, experiences and also the Singapore position. Um, I'll move now to uh, South Korea. Jamin, would you like to make a few uh, comments on, on the South Korean position? Sure, sure, Ramesh. Uh, again, uh, the discussion at Unser Trial uh, is very important and uh, we are very glad to see the development at Unser Trial discussion for the past four years. Uh, and as Natalie just mentioned, South Korea is also supportive of all the key topics uh, that are being tabled at uh, Working Group 3 discussions. In particular, uh, Korea has been interested in enhancing the consistency and coherence of the jurisprudence, jurisprudence of uh, uh, international investment uh, law and the cost and duration, of course, uh, and uh, the introduction of the appellate mechanism. So these issues are uh, the, 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 the topics that have uh, grabbed the attention uh, of South Korea. Uh, and in particular, uh, based upon uh, Korea's experience in ISDS proceedings, particularly for the past 10 years, these issues, consistency, coherence, cost and duration, and the possibility of the introduction of the pellet mechanism have turned out to be uh, critical in maintaining legitimacy and uh, the preserving the policy space for the government in the long run. So South Korea is very keen uh, to uh, observe the development and also observe the different views among different states and how to find some, 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 some compromising ground at the end of the day. One concern uh, that we have, probably many countries as well, is how, how efficiently or, or how soon we, can, or we will be able to finalize the discussion. It is one thing uh, that we are discussing so many important things. It would be quite another that it will take a long and long time. So we are hoping that we could, see, we could see the finalization of the discussion in the relatively short term so that uh, uh, countries like Korea and other countries can adjust its, its system and adjust its uh, uh, international investment agreements in a way that can uh, accommodate new, new systems and new elements of investment agreements uh, in, a, uh, in an efficient manner. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I could now move to uh, uh, Quinn, would you like to give the Vietnamese position? Well, thank you, Romesh. Uh, in this topic, I'd like to speak on my personal capacity because the main, uh, the lead agency in my, because uh, my department is not the lead agency in the working group three ancestral discussion um, from uh, uh, member and of the delegate perspective, uh, I can observe that Vietnam participate actively in own discussion, um, including formal and uh, informal section of uh, working group three. Uh, currently, there is another informal section on um, on the advisory center. Um, we actively participate directly or indirectly in specific issues that are of significant interest to Vietnam, such as security for cost, third party funding. Uh, we have strong interest in damages, uh, including on the discussion on reflective loss, um, the other issues such as code of conduct, frivolous claim, multiple proceeding, and counter claims are also of importance for us. Uh, we also make contribution in the discussion uh, regarding the topic on structural reform, such as a selection of adjudicator, appellate mechanism, and the establishment of permanent investment courts. Uh, however, from a personal perspective, I think that in order to address the shortcoming of investment treaties, a reform is needed uh, not only on procedural matter, but also on substantive matter and 
other method that cannot be categorized whether it's, it's um, um, procedural or substantive, such as umbrella clause damages. Um, for example, with regards to the legitimacy of ISDS, um, we heard many people say that the fact that an arbitrator who are private party uh, now have the power to decide on the application of regulatory measure uh, will have impact far beyond the immediate party to the dispute, namely the investor and the states. Uh, the decision of the arbitrator may have impact on the public on public health, public safety, environment, etc. Uh, therefore, I think the mere creation of a new dispute resolution body uh, or a mechanism uh, for dispute settlement cannot resolve the core of the issues. Uh, I think the solutions should be comprehensive, for example, to provide room for protection of policy space, the recognition of right to regulate, uh, and I think we can clearly observe such need when you analyze the new mono treaties of uh, countries such as the Netherlands, um, India, Brazil, Brazil. Thank you. Um, Quinn, that's a, it's a very interesting issue, the, the Vietnam, uh, Vietnam position, uh, looking for both substantive reforms and, and procedural reforms. Can I, can I just ask a question, uh, just looking at, you know, what's before working group three, there are many, many topics and, and Janssen was talking about, you know, the, the working group three, it's, it's schedule going all the way up till 2026, but it's full of, you know, many, many procedural issues that they have to determine and, and resolve. Do you think that um, adding the, the substantive you know, issues on top of all of that is going to produce even more complex and even more sort of uh, 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 drawn out uh, uh, processes in, in terms of trying to establish reform? Um, thank you, Ramesh. Uh, I think I, I personally do not suggest um, adding the substantive issues to the already very full schedule of, uh, of um, Ancitra Working Group. So what I was trying to say is that um, the purpose of reforming to address the shortcoming of investment treaties um, and invest, international investment law in general cannot be just um, ISDA reform. And even within ISDA reform, we, uh, there are still uh, many uh, issues, including the merely um, procedural issue and some combination between combi um, uh, substantive and procedural issue. And in, uh, from my personal point of view, not no, because I am not in position to present Vietnam official position in this discussion. Uh, I think that uh, to be fis uh, feasible, um, maybe it's better to uh, prioritize and, uh, and create some kind of early harvest um, program that the issues that can be easily addressed uh, should be addressed uh, earlier and the more complicated and more controversial, controversial issue may be discussed later. In that way, after a certain period of time, we may have some more concrete uh, outcome of the working group. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Uh, it's very interesting to see the different approaches. Now we move to India, which is also uh, a very sort of unique uh, um, state in this sphere in, in, in terms of its attitude towards ISDS, uh, its termination of, you know, dozens of treaties. Um, Pramod, would you like to sort of speak on the anti-troll process? Sure. Uh, thank you, Ramesh. Uh, and, you know, I think India's concerns are not very different from those articulated by the previous panelists. I think the concerns relating to consistency and coherence uh, in decision-making the selection of arbitrators uh, has been a concern for India. And, and more importantly, as far as the overbroad interpretation of treaty standards uh, being again, a core concern for India. 
So, so given all these, I think uh, India was again an early proponent for reform of the ISDS system. Uh, it did come out quite firmly in support of ISDS reform at the meeting of the International Legal Advisors of States in October 2016, which got the ball rolling uh, on ISDS re reforms and placed it quite firmly on Nancy Charles' agenda. And India has been an enthusiastic supporter of the reforms agenda since then. Uh, as far as the various proposals for reform are concerned, I, I understand that India has so far kept an open mind on the various proposals for incremental and structural reform. Uh, and it also has kept an open mind on the um, feasibility of a multilateral investment court. Uh, I also understand that India has urged the working group to develop multiple reform options simultaneously whilst maintaining a balance between uh, in incremental reforms and more far reaching structural reform. Uh, India has also expressed a preference for reform proposals to be adopted on a rolling basis, uh, especially since the time frame of the Working Group 3 project now looks set to extend into the year 2026, uh, if not beyond. Uh, in, in that sense, I would imagine that India and many other countries would in particular be supportive of the early adoption of the Code of Conduct, which was mentioned by Quinn before, perhaps as a soft law instrument sooner rather than later. And if that were to happen, it would be quite a significant early harvest success and one which would infuse greater confidence amongst the stakeholders for the prospects of success of further reform initiatives. As far as the adoption of the Multilateral Investment Court is concerned, which is in many respects both a technical issue as well as a political issue, uh, India has emphasized the need for any such structure to first be aligned with the enforcement framework of the New York Convention and the need for a fair and representative mechanism to be put in place for appointment of members to the MIC. Just, just on that topic, sorry, uh, did you finish it, Pramod? Yes, yes, I'm done. Uh, yeah, just on that topic, I think that that was mentioned by um, most speakers about, you know, these structural reforms. Um, obviously, you know, how to choose the arbitrators, um, you know, creating that sort of institutional framework is difficult. Yeah, the, the question that I have if uh, for any of the panelists would be, the, the attempt to actually enforce consistency through one body making decisions, which hopefully will be consistent with each other, um, will that happen in even the short to mid term when not everybody will be on? Let's assume that you know, there is some sort of mechanism that's agreed after Anti Trial Working Group 3. But there will be, I would expect, other states who aren't going to immediately join um, and there'll be you know parallel types of systems working again you know next to each other and isn't there the the, the issue uh, that those parallel systems will be creating decisions will be potentially could be inconsistent with each other um, and where is then the sort of the appellate uh, or the, the investment court uh, um, going to create that sort of consistency uh, when there are other parallel regimes or frameworks out there producing decisions that, that potentially could be con inconsistent? Ramesh, if, if I may. Sure. I think, I think that's a very important question. Uh, and as you just said, uh, perhaps in the short term, uh, it would be inevitable uh, for us to have two parallel systems, perhaps competing and perhaps overlapping uh, for some time. And the critical question is that we need to shorten the time frame so that we can move to the standing mechanism uh, as soon as possible, if that is the consensus. So again, that is what I tried to mean when I mentioned in my, uh, in my, in my talk previously that we need to, to how to find an end point and how to get there as soon as possible. Otherwise, many states will be on the fence and they will have to think about the current regime on the one hand 
in some investment investment agreements. On the other hand, they will have they will also have to deal with new regime under the standing court or standing mechanism with the new types of uh, investment agreements. So the key question is how to shorten or how to expedite the transition period uh, in a, a wider scale. Perhaps thank you. Thank you, Jamin. Anyone else have any thoughts? Okay. Um, so, so I think that we've we've discussed uh, the working group three uh, pretty um, well. There's there's a lot of work to be done. As we said, the timeline is 2026. There are so many issues, um, but I think. Um, Pramod uh, made a good statement about trying to actually consolidate and 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 try first of all, you know, try to get sort of uh, completed items done, such as the code uh, for arbitrators. Um, that will show some good progress. Um, hopefully, the ICSID sort of reform system will also help um, show that you know these things can be done. Um, uh, even though it will take a lot, lot of discussion, a lot of time, a lot of consensus needs to be reached. Um, so <clears throat> thanks everyone for the, your comments on, uh, on the Answer Trial Working Group 3. Um, I just note um, that uh, there's a question and answer function. We, you, know, you can type in, please, any questions you have. Um, so please feel free to do that. We haven't had any questions so far. Um, but um, it would be great to receive some questions if you had any, uh, any issues that you wish to raise uh, with the speakers today. Now, <clears throat> if we could now move to um, the WTO. Now, this is another organization that's looking at these sorts of issues. It's looking at it in a different way. It's not really looking at the um, investment promotion or investor protection that you find in BITs. It's looking more, <clears throat> not at the state, uh, not at investors, but looking more at states and what state obligations are um, uh, between themselves. So <clears throat> you have, we heard yesterday, um, Cliff mentioned that there is no real sort of working text out in the public domain. So we really don't know what the agreed definition of um, uh, investment facilitation would be under this multilateral framework at the moment. But there are signs that it's likely to involve obligations between states to make invest investment laws, policies, regulations, and procedures transparent, predictable, efficient, consistent. So these are all sorts of the <clears throat> issues um, really uh, throwing the ball into the, the state's courts. The states, states need to uh, uh, have a look at this. There was an interesting Columbia uh, um, uh, email today from the Columbia Center um, speaking about, you know, investment facilitation and, and you know, uh, basically the access to information from states. And, and they'd done a survey um, looking at states and how states present their information on investment to investors. And there, there seemed to be still a lot of uh, problems with that. Um, and one of the comments made was, it doesn't really take much to develop your information systems to present all of the information in a sort of comp a comprehensive, sort of accurate way for an investor to know uh, what is required and to enhance efficiency. Um, now, this is all in the sort of um, the WTO context. Um, uh, Stephanie, if you could just change that slide um, to the next slide, I just wanted to add here that <clears throat> this sort of um, investment uh, facilitation, obviously it's been discussed by the WTO and we heard yesterday it's, it's been discussed since 2017, but these sorts of investments facilitation uh, uh, obligations are also starting to be shown in investment treaties. Now I have on your screen at the moment, RCEP, uh, Article 1017 that talks about this. So, you know, this is a, an Asian regional treaty uh, talking about these sorts of investment facilitations. Um, but I just wanted to add that for context. So you've got the, sort of the WTA negotiations going ahead, um, 
trying to do that on, from, from the WTO perspective. And Cliff talked about, you know, how, um, how will you actually uh, be able to integrate these provisions in, into the WTO uh, investment uh, uh, instruments? Um, but also you've got in parallel, you've got now FTAs or these regional, uh, mega regional treaties um, speaking about investment facilitation. I also, uh, I think the ASEAN Comprehensive Investment Agreement also has these sorts of provisions. Um, <clears throat> so there seems to be some momentum. And just to uh, sort of uh, add a final point to my introduction to this area, um, <clears throat> Cliff and Janssen uh, yesterday mentioned that they'd authored a, um, a, a short article about, you know, the concerns about investment facilitation obligations in the sense that these obligations are on states. And <clears throat> there was a concern expressed by Cliff and Janssen very well uh, in their short article that <clears throat> those obligations potentially could raise the risk that a breach or, or, or a non-compliance with those obligations could make their way into investment claims. So you could sort of see these sorts of obligations uh, and an investor could say, well, those obligations haven't been met uh, and could form part of a fair and equitable treatment claim or, or, or add or support an investor claim. So their solution in their article was to say that, um, you know, these any, any sort of investment facilitation uh, framework needs to explicitly say that invest, you know, they will not, um, uh, be used to um, those obligations, any breach of them cannot be used for investor type of claim. Um, so that's the sort of the, the broad picture on WTO uh, uh, negotiations on, on the framework, plus the added sort of dimension of what's happening also in treaty uh, 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 formulations. Uh, I just wonder if the, the, the panel uh, had any thoughts on um, you know, the benefits or what's happening in, in, in this area. Um, I'd leave it open to the panel. If any member uh, wants to jump in, please feel free. Maybe, maybe I could make a start, uh, Ramesh, if that's okay. Yes, thanks, Ramesh. There's, there's a very interesting uh, part of the Columbia study that you referred to. Uh, it said that actually developing countries are better in providing uh, online texts of their FDI laws and regulations, and the Africa region dominates this category. Uh, and the study uh, actually thought that the developed countries actually had a greater way to go in, in providing access to these documents. So uh, anyway, as far, you know, so what I'd like to do is to present very briefly uh, what India's current position seems to be as far as the negotiations within the WTO framework seems to be. Uh, I think moderately skeptical uh, could be a way of expressing India's position uh, on the WTO negotiations on a, on a multilateral framework for investment facilitation. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, I think since the, the Brazil ministerial conference in 2017, uh, there has been a revival of the debate about bringing investment within the scope of the WTO. And, and uh, this time the debate, like you mentioned, Ramesh has shifted from investment protection to investment facilitation. Uh, at, at one level, I think all countries and India included can be expected to have a self-interest in ensuring transparency and predictability. Uh, regarding their respective FDI regulatory frameworks and related matters. So the issue is not really whether investment facilitation is a good thing or not. Uh, however, whether this is a matter that requires an international framework or should it be left to individual states to determine for themselves is likely to be a contentious issue. Uh, second, I would consider that whether pushing for a multilateral framework on investment facilitation should be on the agenda of the WTO is also likely to prove to be contentious and there's been probably no universal consensus so far. Uh, firstly, the, the focus of the WTO is trade, not investment. Uh, also, uh, in the context of the various serious challenges that the WTO has had to contend with, 
in recent times, whether now is the right time for the WTO to focus on widening its scope of functioning is yet another question that has been posed by many. Uh, a, a number of uh, investment facilitation measures deal with the admission of investment. Now, India's model BIT, and in fact, most of the, the previous BITs concluded by India uh, have clearly emphasized the need for excluding any kind of a pre-establishment coverage of investments. And India's traditional approach has been to oppose granting of pre-establishment rights in, in, in investment treaties as states would lose their sovereign right to screen investments at the admission stage. Uh, this is a matter of, uh, I would think, abiding and current concern for India, which has acted in recent times to enhance levels of screening of investments made by investors of countries which have often had uh, frosty ties uh, with India. There's also a sense that uh, provisions of the proposed uh, agreement are not entirely confined to trade facilitation measures alone, but could possibly be construed as imposing substantive obligations as well. And I think the prominent examples that have been cited include the scope of measures, which include any measures that could affect investors and their investments. Uh, there's a, a discussion regarding the inclusion of an MFN clause which closely resembles an MF, a standard MFN clause in the BIT. And India has expressed strong reservations in the past to unconditional MFN clauses in investment treaties, and is highly likely that it would oppose an unconditional MFN clause in the context of any future investment facilitation agreement. Uh, recourse to dispute settlement measures under the terms of the WTO settlement, dispute settlement under, uh, understanding uh, in, in respect of investment facilitation obligations could also prove to be particularly controversial. So for all these reasons, my sense is that whilst India will continue to engage with the discussions, it would probably not be enthusiastic in embracing a multilateral framework on investment facilitation. Thanks, Pramod. Can I just ask you from, you know, from the Indian perspective, um, this is not about uh, if, if you had a system which would exclude, you know, investors using these sorts of provisions to make investors claims. Do you think it's it becomes a big of an issue when your, your investor claims fall out, and you just have these sorts of you know very broad sort of uh, uh, obligations between states? Do you think that that would cause le you know that that would be less uh, of a sort of a disruptive system where, you know, uh, would states really bring as many claims on, on the basis of the failure to uh, uh, comply with investment facilitation obligations? Um, and would that be, you know, would it be a system that it's, is going to be less sort of uh, litigious? It could be uh, because of the of the uh, context in which it is being negotiated. Uh, investors would have no direct access to the uh, WTO dispute settlement processes, and, and therefore we would have to uh, go back to the days of diplomatic protection, when it would have to be home states which ha would have to espouse the grievances of investors. And whether they do so or not in a particular case depends on a number of considerations, which is, which is often considered to be the, the, the weakness of the diplomatic protection system. So I agree with you that you know, this is a system that may potentially not be as disruptive or uh, frequently used as ISDS. Uh, but, but given the, uh, the overlap between a very controversial ISDS regime, uh, to, to have the same kind of issues then litigated uh, before the WTO it is not something which is likely to whet the appetite of a number of states. Thank you, Pramod. Um, Jamin, did you have any 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 thoughts on on this new proposal? Sure, 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 sure Ramesh. Sure. Uh, well, uh, this discussion on uh, the WTO investment facilitation framework uh, is, I think, is very important development. Uh, for the first time now, WTO is taking up the issue of investment seriously. So this is an important development. And as I understand from the WTO website, this proposal is, is gathering a wider support from the WTO members. So this is an important development. One thing perhaps that we should consider, as you mentioned already, Ramesh, uh, is how to uh, how to position this new WTO agreement vis-a-vis -vis investment, international investment agreements. So on the one hand, 
uh, this is investment facilitation under the umbrella of the WTO. But on the other hand, that WTO framework, if it perhaps contains similar provisions as we saw from the screen, which is ALSEP Article 1017, those elements in 1017 contain, if you read it, contain elements that we are seeing from the international investment agreements these days, such as due process, such as transparency, such as consistency. All those issues may arise in the context of perhaps FET provisions, perhaps, or some treatment, national treatment provisions, etc. Uh, so uh, the question is how to insulate the prospective WTO investment agreement from the already controversial and saturated international investment agreements in the long run. So it's okay, I think, for the WTO to pursue its own investment uh, agreement uh, under the umbrella of the trade agreements, but it would be difficult and it would be quite another how to align or how to insulate, how to position separately the WTO agreement and uh, our international investment agreements uh, in, in the long run. So perhaps we need a firewall to separate between the two, uh, to, 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 to stop or to, to separate each regime separately. On the one hand, WTO regime, on the other hand, international investment law regime uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jamin. Yeah, very interesting issues about, you know, two regimes now <laughs> interacting with each other. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's go obviously the debate will continue. Um, Natalie, did you have a, some, some overview comments, I thought, um, or, or should we move on? Um, I think, Ramesh, uh, not very much to, to add substantively, but uh, I would say that Singapore is perhaps, if I could characterize it, considerably more positive towards the process than what has been shared so far um, by, by the other speakers. Uh, we've been participating actively and we, in fact, welcome the discussions and the, and, um, the engagement that has been had on these issues. Um, I'm not able to speak too much on the process um, uh, be because obviously uh, it, it's ongoing at the moment, but um, generally this, this move towards transparency, predictability and efficiency is very much in line uh, with what Singapore aims to do uh, more broadly with our investment, uh, our approach to investment. Can I just ask you um, with your rapporteur hat on, um, so these are sorts of new issues they're developing all the time in parallel with what the working groups looking at um I, you know I, I talked about the sort of the number of issues before the working group and this qu question came up like yesterday it, it, you know if these sorts of issues become very important as the working group progresses is there room to start including these sorts of issues in the working group uh, as, as, as items for discussion or some sort of, um, you know, analysis? As a quick answer, I would say yes, um, because the approach that is being taken in the working group is whatever work plan, and that's been the, the main subject of our recent discussions, how to plan the work that's led us to planning up to 2026, that, that whole work plan is only intended to be notional. And this idea of it being notional is um, broadly understood as being in the context of timing and phasing of the work. Uh, but um, just as an initial reaction, I would say if some of these issues develop in other fora that, are, that prove to be very significant and potentially will impact the work of Unsatral Working Group 3, it would make sense to at least open the discussion for delegations to consider whether or not to bring it into the Unsatral Working Group. To take a position now and say it would not be open to the process um, would be risk setting the working group's work outputs uh, up for potential failure because you would risk running uh, a, a series of outputs that have then not kept a pace with the developments that are taken on the side. And so, as you've rightly pointed out, in a process that's long running, or it, well, in UN terms, this is not really long running, but I think uh, in the world that we are, a lot of us are used to, it is a quite a long running process and especially considering the urgency that many um, states and delegations place on the issue, uh, it's important to be able to be flexible, nimble and responsive to developments that are taking place outside of the working group, working group three framework as currently conceived. Yeah, and 
it's uh yeah we're all it seems like there's just like a fulcrum point everything's starting to sort of there's so many sort of interests and groups revolving around these sorts of issues um i think um yeah you've got your work you, you're going to be very busy for a number of years there natalie um, so now let's just uh, move on. We're getting a couple of questions through. That's great. Um, if we could just sort of try to sort of get through our subjects, and then we can. We've got some. We've got a lot of questions that um, we can now start answering. Um, <clears throat> the next issue that we uh, we're going to discuss um, is approaches to bilateral and regional treaty making. Now. Um, <clears throat> Uh, if I could uh, ask Stephanie to go to the next slide, I just thought <clears throat> I should start this by um, mentioning some re research that the Centre for International Law had done, which is quite interesting. Um, <clears throat> the International Dispute Resolution Team here at the Centre for International Law, we searched over 3,000 investment treaties um, and very surprisingly, we only found 53 treaties that contained a reference to mediation, so investor state mediation. Um, <clears throat> now, and then we concluded, though, that Asia Pacific states have been a significant driver behind the increase in international um, investment agreements with investor state mediation provisions. Asia Pacific states or their administrative region, regions, i.e., Hong Kong. Um, have been parties to 21 out of the 53 international investment agreements, uh, that's 36%, that contain references to mediation. Stephanie, if we could have the next slide, please. <clears throat> now, this is, and, and, and then we put that into a sort of like a, a, a bar graph, and we, we saw the results here, but you see in the red, the red represents states um, the, well, treaties concerning Asia Pacific states, the blue is the rest of the world. And you see this quite interesting thing, increase, and it's, it's quite disproportionate, the, the number of Asia Pacific states that are signing uh, investment treaties with mediation. Now, the numbers are very low, very low, like we're only talking about 53 treaties. But if you look, you know, and, and if you just look at the proportion, uh, of, of treaties with mediation provisions that are being signed each year, <clears throat> the Asia Pacific is leading the way in, in a sense. Um, so all of those red parts of the bars represent um, treaties to which Asia Pacific states belong. Um, <clears throat> so it's a quite an interesting aspect of this and, and combined obviously with the Singapore Mediation Convention, um, <clears throat> there seems to be a very, like a slight, there's an increase in mediation provisions. Um, and our research found that there was a decrease in conciliation provisions. Um, but the mediation provisions are, are going up and Asian states seem to be sort of embracing this trend. Um, so I was just wondering um, if there were any thoughts from uh, the members of the panel about this trend, especially from an Asian perspective um, you hear all these, you know, you hear a lot about sort of the Asian sort of um, uh, propensity to, to settle disputes. Um, is there something that's being detected here that, that is sort of uh, forms a part of a, a, a trend that may uh, turn out to be something that's going to last into the future, for, especially for Asian states? Natalie, given that uh, uh, you, you're so in, what, involved with the, the Mediation Convention, I'm just wondering whether you had any thoughts. Um, yes, certainly, Ramesh, happy to, to jump in and, and get us started, started on this. I think Singapore, uh, as, as a delegation, we've certainly been supportive of the explicit inclusion of mediation provisions and treaties in, in any number of forms. It could be in relation to taking up mediation and cooling off period as a complement to arbitration um, or even as a standalone dispute settlement mechanism. And these various methods are reflected in our treaties. 
Uh, for example, in the Singapore Indian BIT, in the EU Singapore IPA, we have a standalone mechanism for mediation. In the CPTPP, there isn't a standalone um, mechanism, but there is an explicit provision for disputing parties to enter into mediation at any stage of the process, even after the um, uh, an arbitral tribunal has been constituted. And I think this reflects um, our belief that express mediation provisions will at least actively encourage investors and states to consider mediation as part of their um, dispute resolution uh, suite of tools that are available to them. And um, uh, in the context of working group three, this has led to a position that we, we, we've um, suggested that uh, we would support the development of model mediation provisions being developed by the working group that could either be used as base text for treaty negotiations or else incorporated into the procedures for any eventual permanent mechanisms that may come out of the work of working group three. I think one of the questions is why also there is this support for mediation um, in the context of investor state dispute settlement. And to this, uh, I would cite, um, well, I don't know if I would say, I would call them the traditional uh, strengths of mediation, but I think they hold out even stronger in the context of investor state dispute settlement. So in addition to being cost effective, time effective, this flexibility and autonomy for disputing parties, very important for the investor state context because we're talking about public policy issues, often public interest um, uh, and, and other stakeholder interests are engaged and also uh, implications on the state's right to regulate. So this autonomy, an ability to design a solution beyond what initially triggered the dispute, beyond monetary compensation, uh, I would say is even more important, uh, arguably, in the invest state context. And then there's the consideration um, of how um, you might want to preserve the relationship between the investor and the host state. And oftentimes when we're talking of that relationship, uh, it's usually long term, usually involves complex uh, relationships that are, are highly intertwined and to some extent even interdependent. So there is a high value placed on being able to preserve that relationship, notwithstanding the existence of a dispute. And of course, now with the Singapore Convention, um, it's not simply... Uh, um, a, a, an outcome that you would agree to and then take the risk of it not being enforceable afterwards. Uh, rather, with the Singapore Convention, the idea is with um, uh, parties that up to the Singapore Convention, you could have the mediated outcome enforced or invoked in the courts of that state, provided, of course, the reservation under uh, 81A of the Singapore Convention has not been taken. Uh, so, all in, I would say that there are benefits to mediation in the investor state context, also considering the, the monetary aspect, uh, money at stake is often very, very high. Um, and so putting all that together, it really supports um, having mediation as an explicit option in the investment treaties. And at least that's what uh, I, would, I, would, I would set out as having motivated Singapore's interests in this area. Uh, but, but of course, our other colleagues on the, on the call might have, might have other views. Great. Um, I, I see that there's a, a question from Professor Alvarez sort of on this point about the uh, mediation, especially the, the numbers of, of treaty signed. Professor Alvarez, could you, did you, have you got access to a microphone? It might be interesting to hear, hear, your, hear you um, uh, articulate your question. Hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, but the problem was that I was switched over to um, ordinary participant in order to put my Q and A uh, okay. in box. So that was the irony. But no, I'm happy to. Uh, I guess I, I I appreciate everything that Natalie has said about why, in principle, it would make sense. But the evidence isn't there. The numbers that you have are very small. Uh, in terms of the actual treaties that have had it. But of course, you have had quite a bit of treaties that have anticipated both state-to-state -state conciliation uh, in the past, and at least publicly, uh, at least the public information we have, is very, very little use of it. I would also stress that even though the Singapore Convention has been around for a while, 
it has extremely few ratifiers to date. So that I think states talk a good tune in places like working group three. They have the rhetoric that they support mediation, but everything that we've had uh, that history suggests is that they don't do it. Uh, that is, and we do have surveys from Queen Mary, uh, from uh, Singapore's own center. Lucy Reed was involved in one of them. Uh, that shows that when you ask uh, corporate counsel and when you ask states involved in these, they frequently say that what they want is binding uh, resolution, uh, usually ISDS, precisely because they want to blame somebody else for the result, especially if they have to pay some money. So that I don't think um, there is much support. I, I, I think it'd be lovely to have more of these options, but I guess I'm quite skeptical that both states and investors will use them. Natalie, I see if you want to respond, fine, but I, I see that um, Quinn had some responses to um, uh, if, if Quinn uh, feels comfortable in, in, in response, she, she wrote some respond, uh, responses, but would you like to articulate those, Quinn? Uh, thank you, Romes. Uh, I'd like to uh, have um, a response to Professor Anvarez's uh, question. Uh, I'm not sure that it reflects the, the, the actual situation in all other countries, but it's just my personal guessing. I think that the fact that many disputes are resolved by direct negotiation and settlement um, prove that actually the parties may not be too reluctant to an amicable settlement. And actually, it's not that they need someone to blame for, for the for the the, the, the removal of, so, sorry, for, for the payment of the compensation, if any. Uh, I think among the reason why mediation is less used than uh, binding um, arbitration, um, because uh, one of the reason is that mediation is available for investment disputes. Uh, quite late compared to the arbitration. And when we look at the history of exit, it was established in the 1965, but uh, the, the number of cases only strongly increased around the 1990s. Um, and uh, apart from arbitration, mediation also had to compete with direct negotiation and sometimes people prefer direct negotiation for on the, um, the privacy and the, they, they, they have, um, when they have mutual trust, they can go directly to negotiation and don't have to go to uh, some um, more established procedure in mediation. Um, and compared to um, arbitration, I think mediation is more suitable for the dispute where the party have a higher level of mutual trust and motivation to return the relationship than arbitration. And the type of dispute belong to this category might be less than the type of dispute that is more suitable for, for arbitration. And, and that's what I have in mind, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Quinn. And, and, and I think Natalie w wanted to make a, a small reply as well. Um, thanks very much, Ramesh. I just wanted to reply on uh, with regards to two points. Uh, first, the small number of ratifications, the Singapore Convention, I think, needs to be viewed in context. The um, open for si opening for signature of the convention was in August 2019. In fact, it's a whopping number of uh, initial signatories, 46 major economies amongst them. And we had entry into force barely a year, just over a year afterwards in September 2020. So that's actually um, quite a good take up rate and very, very fast considering how long it takes for ratification processes to work through internally um, uh, for, for, for a lot of states. And with regards to the second point, um, little use of uh, mediation and its uh, rare reflection in treaties, I think that's certainly very true. And that's something that we need to look at. 
Working Group 3 delegations have expressed a desire to address this. Uh, they see this as a major issue that should be addressed. And I also, and one of the things that has come up, and Singapore shares this, is a lack of familiarity amongst users of mediation, um, or rather users of the dispute uh, settlement mechanism of mediation as a tool in dispute resolution. And this, this is something that does need to be looked into perhaps by capacity building efforts, not just for states, but also investors um, and, and states themselves need to look into how they set themselves up internally, structure themselves, so that these issues of allegations of lack of accountability and corruption can be avoided. Because I do think that is a problem as a CIL study that Professor Alvarez mentioned has shown. And Natalie, can I just sort of add to Professor Alvar Alvarez's sort of line of questioning? Um, so if you see that our, the CIL research on your screen there. So in 2019, we only found three IAAs, three um, that had mediation provisions. Uh, 2020, only two. Um, now, but, you know, there could be others, but it's the numbers are very small. And you have this sort of, you've got the Singapore Convention now, people are aware of it, but uh, do you, can, can you sort of, um, can we understand why states aren't still including more provisions on mediation in their investment treaties? Or is it sort of a place where uh, there's work to increase that number in the future? I certainly think there's work to increase that number in the future, but if I had to just hazard a guess, because it's difficult to say why uh, for certain and definitively and for, for all different um, states, they, their reasons would be different. Uh, but I, I would hazard a guess that the Singapore Convention really has only entered into force um, last year and treaty negotiation processes take years. So I think there will be a lag time that we will see between this uh, entry into force date of the Singapore Convention and its reflection, or rather the reflection of mediation in these treaties to the extent that enforcement um, has been identified as an obstacle for these states, which uh, a 2020 SIDRA survey, I believe, did, did demonstrate that the issue of enforceability was a major one for, for a number of users of uh, mediation. So I think there will be a lag uh, because of the nature of treaty negotiation processes, but hopefully um, in a few years time, we will see this uh, bar, these bars go up uh, as, as the years proceed. Excellent. Um, any other panelists have any other views on, the, on this issue? It seems to be an interesting issue that's raised a lot of questions. Pramod? Ramesh, can I just add a couple of points? You know, I think uh, the, the statistic that you, you, you mentioned uh, 53 treaties out of 3,000 have a mediation provision, uh, may not tell the entire story because I, I would imagine every treaty would have a provision which enables a trigger notice to be sent, followed by a long cooling off period. And the underlying intention behind all those provisions is that there is a window of time for the state and the investors to engage with each other and try and resolve their dis disputes amicably, whether by direct negotiations, as Quinn said, or by mediation. Uh, and there hasn't been too much take up of that. So the, the trigger notice actually triggers off the cooling off period. Nothing much happens uh, in most cases. And, and then the matter goes to binding dispute settlement. And, and you know, having acted for states and having acted for investors, uh, I, I would uh, agree uh, a lot with Professor Alvarez's analysis from the state's perspective. As far as the, uh, the investor's perspective is concerned, you know, for a long period of time, uh, uh, you know, commencing a BIT uh, arbitration was akin to pressing the nuclear button. Uh, it may not be anymore uh, because BIT arbitration is becoming more commonplace, but the fact remains that the investor is in a host state to do business and not to really sue the host state. So there, there is that commercial uh, incentive for the investor to settle. The second, and this is increasingly uh, becoming evident, that the investor, uh, even if it succeeds in an arbitration, has a huge enforcement risk. It's not easy to enforce an arbitration award against a state. Uh, it may take a lot of time and it will definitely prove to be very expensive. Uh, and in any case, ISDS proceedings are expensive from an investor's point of view. So I think there would always be an incentive for an investor to try and resolve a dispute through mediation or by negotiations. But as far as the state is concerned, 
uh, as Professor Alvarez said, the reason why uh, governments probably are lukewarm to mediation or direct negotiations is because there's always someone else to be blamed. Uh, if there is a mediated resolution, however fair and beneficial, it is likely to be criticized by domestic constituencies. Uh, you know, there could be people who uh, allege some level of collusion, corruption, or any other kind of unhealthy relationship between the government and an investor. Uh, and the, the other dynamic that often operates is ISDS disputes take a long period of time to be resolved, uh, a minimum of probably around uh, uh, two and a half to three years, a maximum, I mean, there have been cases that have gone for more than 10 years. So it, very often you know, the, the thinking in governments seems to be that this could well be someone else's problem, which they would deal with. And for that, they could, be, you know, that could explain the reluctance of states to engage with the dispute and try and resolve it at the initial stages. Yep. Uh, can I just mention, I, I've had direct experience of this um, in, in during the negotiation period, you know, the consultation or negotiation period before you commence an arbitration. The fact that it, the provision doesn't say it, it's only negotiation, it doesn't, it doesn't refer to mediation. It, uh, it's, it's more difficult to, start, to, to sort of get a mediator involved in that process. Um, simply because it's not, it's not actually explicitly mentioned uh, that a mediator may um, uh, participate in that process. Um, so, uh, you know, my experiences of, of that con consultation period um, haven't been very good. Uh, and I think that if you had the active participation of a third party mediator or conciliator, um, that would improve the process. And um, to get that process along, uh, in, in my view, the requirement, the explicit requirement in that um, provision that says, um, you know, there's a cooling off period, uh, you may resort to mediation, um, those sorts of words would help uh, significantly. But Pramana, I'm, I'm not sure if um, you've had the experience um, uh, that, uh, you know, there's no mention of a mediator, therefore it's not done. Uh, a mediator is not involved in that process. Uh, well, not, not in the context of investment arbitration, but uh, you know, very often in the context of commercial disputes, you may have a multi-tier dispute resolution clause, which makes no mention of mediation, but it's quite a uh, common phrase for parties to explore the possibility of mediation despite it not being mentioned. Uh, and, and that does happen quite often. Uh, and I would, I would imagine that if there is a real appetite to settle uh, and if there's some progress made through negotiations, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't think that uh, uh, either a state or an investor would be reluctant to try mediation simply because mediation is not mentioned in the treaty. Uh, I, I think the real problem, the nub of the problem seems to be that identified by Professor Alvarez, which is that in order for negotiation to work or for mediation to work, uh, what is required is political will on the part of the state. Uh, and absent that political will, you know, mediation and negotiation is unlikely to see much traction in the ISDS sphere. Thanks, Pramod. Um, Professor Jamin, did you, did you have any thoughts on this area? Uh, uh, sure, Ramesh, v very briefly. Uh, I just would like to, uh, to echo what you uh, and Pramod and Natalie just mentioned. I, I think I, I do see the difference between statistics uh, and uh, I would say increasing attention to mediation. I think one of the reason is the lack of, lack of structuralization or systematization. If you look at the IIAs, even the IIAs that have mediation provisions, they simply refer to the possibility of mediation, just at one option as, as a resolving disputes. In that situation, as Pramod just mentioned, I think it would be very, it would be very difficult for any government official to go forward on behalf of the country to negotiate and to mediate and accept the, uh, accept the outcome. Maybe that is one of the reasons uh, of low utilization of mediation. And that probably explains the increasing tendency of elaborating the procedures of mediation in many respects, which is also reflected in the exit mediation rules as well. I think those st st systematization elaboration and structuralization of mediation will probably help the states to think about mediation very seriously, perhaps. Right. I think uh, given the liveliness of the discussion, it's obviously a topic that uh, 
is going to sort of be around for a while. Um, but great to see the mediation convention um, and let's see the, 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 uh, the progress of it and um, how mediation fares in the future. Um, now, <clears throat> the, we're still on the topic of, um, you know, approaches to bilateral investment, uh, bilateral and regional treaty making. But I thought just to save some time, let's just combine that with that, our last topic about, you know, the treaty making and also Asian approaches. Um, and we just combine this into one sort of subject um, Meg Kinnear yesterday said she really didn't see sort of any distinct Asian blocks, um, but that Asian states were collaborative and, and helpful uh, in, in, in the exit reform process. Um, I think one of the speakers noted that um, uh, Asian states were including investment facilitation provisions in their treaties. Uh, RCEP was the exact, you know, is a, an example that we've referred to. But does the panel think that there are these sorts of um, Asian voices, Asian approaches to investment law reforms that uh, you could categorize as being truly from this region? Would um, Pramod, do you, would you like to sort of have a go at that question? Let me let me give it a try. Uh, you know, I think uh, probably it's worth making two points, which are uh, which are very obvious. I would guess. Uh, you know, I think it's it's a fact that international investment law thus far has been shaped by capital exporting countries of Europe and North America, uh, and the Western model that is still the dominant template of of BITs that are prevalent across the world. Also, at a subsidiary level, I think norm creation by arbitrators has also largely been driven by arbitrators from North America and Europe who dominate the pool of arbitrators appointed to hear ISDS cases. Uh, and, and, you know, and the, the other aspect is that Asia uh, is not really a monolithic block. It, it is comprised of states which have very high levels of GDP growth, uh, very high investment flows and per capita income. It also has a number of lower income countries. Uh, there are capital exporting states, there are capital importing states, and there are many who are both. So, so these geopolitical differences and tensions have probably had you know, a significant role to play in, in preventing closer alignment and cooperation when it comes to norm creation in international law and international investment law in particular. Uh, I would also think that the three biggest economies in Asia, China, Japan, and India, have traditionally not been too assertive in playing a focal role when it comes to reshaping the investment law system. You know, you know, other economies like, uh, like Korea and Singapore have, of course, taken the lead uh, and, and not the bigger economies. Uh, but, but I think the, the landscape seems to be gradually changing uh, in, in the context of you know, the growing importance of Asia. And I think more importantly, the increasing involvement of Asian parties in investment arbitrations. I think now a number of Asian states have started to wake up and play a more involvement, involved role in the recalibration of international investment law. And, and although uh, you know, I, I would agree with Meg uh, that you know, a lot of uh, Asian states have not really been participating as a bloc, but they've still been very active in engaging with the work of the working group. And they've made very useful interventions in the discussion, both in relation to the proposed incremental reforms and in relation to structural reforms. And uh, you know, I think for instance, uh, China's proposal for a standalone appeals body as an alternative to the multilateral investment court it is certainly a model that is worth considering further. And it can perhaps be integrated more easily as an additional layer to the current framework of resolution of investment disputes. Uh, it would be, I would imagine, a less drastic measure to uh, the full-fledged multilateral investment court that has been proposed. So it's a bit of a halfway house. And uh, it, it would probably be easier to integrate this with other treaties such as the New York Convention. Uh, and, and as far as uh, treaty making is concerned, I think there are newer models. Uh, of course, there is the more extreme version of, of India's model BIT, which so far has not really been uh, uh, able to establish itself as a template for new uh, balanced BITs that could be entered into balanced in the sense of recognizing the need to ensure a robust system of investment protection, as well as uh, you know, understanding the need for states to exercise regulatory powers. But, but I think a good model uh, that, that can be used and one that seems to be emerging 
uh, is the, the ASEAN uh, practice. And I think the, the ASEAN Comprehensive Investment Agreement has been quite influential. And the various ASEAN plus agreements have provided a comprehensive framework addressing both trade and investment. And what's interesting about these treaties is that they've been able to strike what is perceived to be a new and a fairer balance between the need to, to provide a framework for investment protection uh, and, and balance this with the state's need to preserve legitimate policy and regulatory space for host governments. Thanks very much, uh, Pramod. Um, uh, Jamin, would you, do you have any perspectives on this, this issue? Sure, sure, Ramesh. Uh, well, uh, I think a Asia uh, has become the hub of uh, investment and trade uh, over the years. Uh, and many Asian countries are now realizing the importance of, uh, importance of uh, continuing inflow of, of investment and also how to find a good balance between the protection of investors and how to maintain uh, the national sovereignty or policy space. So I think the unique experience of Asian states, uh, of course, there are many different levels of development in the Asian region alone, but at the same time, the, the unique experience of many Asian countries uh, uh, in this region uh, could probably uh, provide an important uh, contribution to the discussion of ISDS reform and perhaps the substantive issue reform in the future. Uh, and uh, I think Asians are very good at finding a balance between the two competing interests, as we saw in the successful, uh, successful finalization of uh, Singapore Convention. So perhaps we could, uh, Asian countries could contribute to the success of this important and challenging project as well, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you, German. Um, Quinn, any, any thoughts? Um, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry, I was mute. That's okay. Um, I would like to provide some observation uh, from a researcher perspective. Um, uh, watching the experience of Vietnam in uh, from the ASEAN perspective, because I can uh, I don't have much uh, experience in saying for the whole Asian area. Uh, with regard to Vietnam, we have more than 60 bilateral investment treaties and uh, three, uh, sorry, two third of them signed in the 1990s uh, and more than 10 investment chapters in FTAs. Over the past uh, 15 years, uh, there is a lot of development in the bilateral investment treaty taking from the experience uh, of the negotiation of investment chapter in FTAs. Um, um, I used to, I saw a question from the audience that what, uh, about what are the substantive um, reforms taken by the countries and I can provide some example in our team to create more balance between the need to attract foreign uh, investment and the need to protect the interest of the public. Uh, with, uh, with regards to substantive reform, we have clearer definition and more defined scope uh, of application of the investment agreement. We have more detailed provision in substantive laws uh, such as uh, expropriation, indirect expropriation, fair and equitable treatment, uh, um, etc. We also have more exceptions um, to protect policy space for the government, such as um, exception on transfer regarding financial measures, uh, reservations against uh, NT, MFN, etc. And we, we also have general exception, security exception. With regards to uh, substance, uh, sorry, procedural issue, uh, in general, we have more detailed ICS provision uh, with uh, and we are trying to develop a little bit more about the issue that has been uh, discussed uh, under ANSITRA Working Group 3, such as security for cost or uh, third party funding uh, damages, etc. Uh, with regards to ASEAN, I think uh, even though we do not, um, I mean, the, the, the voice of the country in uh, international. Um, discussions such as exit 
uh, and Citroën might vary, but within ASEAN, we have very quite comprehensive and consistent practice uh, with regards to the negotiation of investment treaty. Uh, for example, we have very um, consistent definition of investment or cover investment. Uh, we have uh, consistent in the scope of application of ISDS, which cover most of the time only post-establishment periods. And we, in terms of the procedural issues, we also share the same view in addressing parallel claim and addressing reflective loss, etc. So th that's what I have in mind. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very, interesting. very interesting. And finally, we have Natalie. Do you have any, any thoughts on this, this issue? Um, thanks very much, Ramesh. Uh, a lot of what has been said by the speakers before me, Pranod Kun and Jamin, I very much agree with. Certainly, historically, um, we have not seen the development of a distinct Asian voice, but the trade and economic flows are shifting towards Asia, and I think that will be that that will that only bodes in many senses well for the future in terms of this development of a distinct Asian voice. Within ASEAN, um, to, in many respects, I do think actually there is an ASEAN voice. Pramod alluded to this uh, by referring to the ASEAN Plus agreements. I mean, we've got the ACIA, the ASEAN Comprehensive Investment Agreement that uh, in many ways formed the base um, text for the ASEAN Dialogue Partner Agreements. And then from there, we built other larger agreements like the RCEP. Um, and, and so I think through that, we can determine a form of ASEAN voice. Structurally, through the negotiation process, ASEAN delegations coordinate their position first before engaging the dialogue partners. So in that sense, there is also um, an element of speaking with one voice on the part of ASEAN. And at UNCITRAL, as well as other fora, um, where we've seen investment reform issues taken up, whilst there is no coordinated ASEAN position, um, a lot of the ASEAN delegations are increasingly active in these fora, and many a time the delegations do substantively concur in what is being said. So whilst formally I don't think we can brand um, an ASEAN voice in terms of uh, how it may be developed in these multilateral fora, the outcome in terms of its, its convergence and concurrence uh, does suggest that there is one. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. It seems like um... You know, there is some sort of um, voice, um, ASEAN especially, um, and obviously, you know, RCEP was, you know, it's the, the, the depository, I think, is the ASEAN Secretariat, right? So, um, and there's a lot of sort of development going on in, in that space. Um, <clears throat> we've got through the, 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 the topics that we had to discuss, but there's, there's a question that's very interesting from Professor Alvarez, and there was, an, there was another uh, question also uh, about, well, one question was about the criticism by environmental activists and academic society. And Professor Alvarez's uh, sort of question is about, um, you know, sustainable development goals and, you know, the need for, and, and Professor Alvarez, step in if, if I've uh, uh, sort of misrepresented your question, but the need for this sort of um, the need for an FDI to mitigate climate change, global health needs, all of those sorts of very important features of, of uh, 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 global society today. Um, my, my example is, you know, <clears throat> if you are going to sort of generate power through electric cars, for example, then, um, you know, all of these new technologies need need to be looked at and not just technologies um, and they need investment, but also just the, the different materials that you will need for a car. So there, you know, a car will need apparently five times more copper than uh, uh, um, a normal car to, to run on electricity. So, you know, the, the, there was a very interesting article in the Financial Times a few weeks ago about this need for copper if you're going to produce electric cars. It's all sort of creating this need for new investment uh, and how does the sort of the two sides of the coin coexist? You've got the environmentalists saying, you know, <clears throat> ISDS is not good, but then you need ISDS, well, you need investment supported by some form of uh, 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 protections 
to promote sustainable goals. Um, Professor Alvarez, is, is, was that the sort of uh, issue that you were getting at and how, how to re reconcile the two sides of the coin? I think uh, you've captured you've captured it. Uh, just to give you some statistics, back in 2014, UNCTAD in its annual report uh, reported back in 2014, pre-COVID, that there was a $2.5 trillion per year shortfall in what it thought was needed foreign capital flows just to fulfill the SDGs. It specified that in yearly reports in 2010, uh, you needed up to 1.2 trillion to maintain greenhouse gas emissions at current levels. Uh, and virtually every expert agrees that this is, has to be provided by private capital, including foreign capital. And it is it, it, what I think is very interesting in UNCTAD is that it's trying very hard to have its reform agenda with IIAs uh, have something to do with sustainable development. But frankly, I don't see the major reform agenda that is focused on ISDS reform really talking about how ISDS reforms, all the ones that have been on the table, relate to this dire critical need for foreign capital. Uh, and, and so I'm just curious how the particular governments on this panel see this uh, intricate tension. Um, may I, Rumi? Sure, please, sure, please. Uh, Thank you, Professor Andres. Um, uh, we, um, I think we share the need for um, balance of um, balance between the attraction of foreign investment and the protection of public uh, interest. And I think that uh, these two aspects uh, do not contradict to each other. Um, I think the um, investor also benefits from better environments. Um, with regards to the measures taken uh, during the COVID time, uh, I think from uh, Vietnam, um, our government had been very active in um, promoting for investment, not only within the reform of, of uh, investment treaty, including the uh, substantive and, um, and um, procedural aspect, um, but we also actively in uh, pursuing and promoting for investment. Uh, we had just revised our law on investment to allow clearer and transparent um, um, framework for investment, clearer condition for, for, for market access for foreign investment. Uh, we also have um, many uh, investment promotion events uh, online and uh, we create the mechanism of special incentives for foreign, for investment during which the prime minister can have the power to negotiate and provide exceptional, uh, exceptional um, favorable incentives to, um, to use for investment that of, signif uh, of significant impact to the economy uh, and uh, investment in uh, high tech industry. And that's uh, a summary of, of in brief of what we do during after the COVID time. Any other panelists yeah, like to like make some contributions? <laughs> Natalie? I'm happy to, yep, yeah, I'm just, uh, happy to jump in here a bit as well. Um, I agree with Kim that the recalibration towards a balanced approach is not necessarily inimical to investor interest. Um, and I, no I note that uh, Professor Alvarez has focused specifically on this idea of ISDS reform and quite a number of the reform elements, uh, whilst, it's, uh, whilst uh, it, at least in answer trial is a state driven process, a number of states have espoused um, the view that it is important 
important to keep investors involved in whatever reform outcomes take place. So, for example, taking Singapore as, exa as an example, uh, for a nomination of arbitrators to a permanent mechanism, we think that this should be open to the investing community. If there's a screening panel for such arbitrators, perhaps we can have members of the investing community on such panel. Um, and certain measures, such and the whole, the whole discussion on uh, third party funding that's taking place at Exit and UNSUTRAL, uh, those uh, are delegations, and there are a number of delegations who support not banning third party funding, and Singapore is one of them, uh, simply regulating it by not banning it, as this would promote access to justice for a number of investors that wouldn't have access otherwise to the investor state dispute settlement process. So it, focusing only on the ISDS reform uh, aspect, I do think there are certain reform options that are being pursued um, that look out for investor interests. Um, and of course, substantively, a lot of the newer treaties by incorporating further specificity and prescription in the substantive protection standards, um, those also I think provide certainty and hopefully will encourage investor flows rather than uh, prohibit or inhibit them. Thanks, Natalie. Um, Promoto Jamin, up to you. Um, we're, we're sort of we've got about eight minutes left, but if you had any thoughts, I'm happy to hear. But uh, if not, there's uh, there's some more questions we can answer. Thank you, thank you, Ramesh. Uh, I, I also think that uh, uh, it uh, the question is how to find the balance, how to strike a balance between the protection of foreign investors uh, and preserving the regulatory space. Uh, so I think uh, I, I think Queen has pointed that point uh, out, and uh, the the question is how to find the the, the, the appropriate balance. Uh, and uh, that said, uh, as Professor Alvarez mentioned, uh, and I do agree, uh, what we are discussing here in the context of reform is only relates to uh, the, the discussions are only related to the uh, investment. Uh, dispute settlement proceedings, and uh, we are not even discussing the substantive issues, uh, substantive topics, the many key provisions of the IIAs. Probably they are the pending issues for the future, and maybe that could be taken up in future discussion of multilateral conventions on investment. But uh, until that time, perhaps what we can do is to fix the problem that we are feeling uh, at the moment, and that uh, that that particular problem uh, seems to be the investment uh, investment arbitration issue for now. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, we're running out of time. I think there, there was an interesting question by um, Professor Kalamita about the multiple tracks of reform. So he, he was asking, you know, there are multiple tracks of reform, ICSID, UNCTRAL, WTO, UNCTAD, how do states maintain a coherent approach across all of those, uh, uh, um, those sorts of reform procedures? How, is there some sort of silo, uh, siloing inevitable in the way that governments treat sort of these reform procedures in, in these different uh, 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 forum? Um, anyone have any thoughts? And, and, and by the way, um, uh, Janssen, you've got a microphone access. So if you want to elaborate on your question, please free to, feel free to jump in. Uh, thanks very much. I, I, think, I, th I think you've, you, you've, you've captured it. Um, and particularly just knowing the way the governments work, this would seem to be a challenge for, uh, for most states to, um, to keep their positions coordinated across these divergent uh, forums, um, especially since WTO and uh, investment are often not handled by the same people. Um, and I imagine that this would be a particular challenge for developing states, but it'd be interesting to hear from the uh, participants we have here as to how their countries are approaching this issue. We start with uh, Pramod. Thanks, Ramesh. Um, well, you know, I think you, you've uh, mentioned a very, very important point. Uh, I think especially, uh, you know, now that the working group three discussions are getting more intense and there are probably far more meetings 
on a regular basis than was envisaged when the project started. Uh, I think uh, many developing countries find themselves stretched in terms of resources to, to deal with the discussions. And I think that is a real problem. And, and that may also explain why uh, you know, a lot of substantive input uh, is still coming from the traditional players and not from people who are often at the receiving end of norm creation in international investment law. And that is a problem. Uh, in, in terms of the, the multiple tracks of reform, I, I don't think that by in itself uh, is a bad thing. Uh, I think it's a good thing to have competition between various arbitral institutions, which can tweak uh, their rules to make sure that they are up to date and relevant. And that kind of competition in the marketplace is only a good thing. But in terms of the, the, the main kinds of reforms that are uh, being um, discussed, you know, I think one very good option or one very good model that could be adopted is the model of the Transparency Convention, the Mauritius Transparency Convention. And, and if that model is adopted, you know, whether it's the code of conduct or whether it is the standalone appellate committee or whether it's a multilateral investment court, uh, you know, that is a model which can be integrated. You know, I think uh, it, it's probably going to, have to, going to be a lot of thought which needs to go into it, but I think uh, the, the Mauritius Convention model is one that could work to integrate uh, you know, any kind of reforms that come out of this process uh, into existing structures that we have in international investment law. So the code of conduct would apply as much to an exit arbitration as it would to an arbitration administered by the PCA. Uh, the the uh, appeals committee uh, could probably have jurisdiction over both uh, 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 you know, a decision rendered by an exit tribunal as well as an ad hoc tribunal under the auspices of the PCA. So you know, I think uh, in some senses it's it's good to have the competition. Uh, in, in certain other senses, and I'm sure that the working group is is apprised of this. You know, I, I think the solutions that will have to be adopted, uh, you know, the only ones that could be efficient are the ones that could be integrated quite easily across the parallel structures that we have today. And that uh, is a harmonized approach, which I'm sure most states will be conscious of whilst discussing the various reform initiatives. Thanks, very insightful there, Pramod. Um, anybody else before we, we wrap up? May I? Sure. sure. Um, with regards to Vietnam, um, I think uh, even though there are multiple forum to discuss the reform of investment law, international investment law uh, in Vietnam, uh, we have a con consistent policy uh, for the um, for the development and um, attraction of foreign investment uh, up to uh, 2050. So uh, we are, uh, even though the, the issue might be led by different agencies, we need, all of us need to, con to be consistent with that policy. Uh, the second, we have a consultation mechanism and before making um, public an official position in each uh, forum, we have to concern uh, the key um, stakeholders. So we need to come up with a, an agreement on that. And we try to have a diverse representation at the meeting. So most of the relevant agency will be invited to the meetings uh, to try to have consistent uh, views and um, information among different forums. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we're running out of time unless anybody has um, any other views I'd like to express. Okay, we're, we're right on the, almost on the hour. Um, I really very much like to thank our expert speakers. As I said, they were expert and they showed it today, um, their understanding of the subjects. Um, I've got written down in my notes, there are multiple tracks of reform, multiple procedural issues, multiple uh, substantive issues, multiple organizations, multiple instruments, all sort of mixed in here. Um, so it's a very hard and complex area that's being sorted through very slowly, but we understand why it's slow. Uh, there are so many issues and so many sensitive uh, uh, aspects to all of these uh, issues that we've talked about today. We talked about the Asian approach today. I hope the uh, audience um, got something uh, from that. Uh, I, I surely did. Um, 
But I, again, thank you very much for your time and uh, 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 comments uh, and consideration today. Um, I'll hand you back over to Stephanie, but thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Romesh. Uh, dear, dear, dear panelists panel. and participants, thank you once again for being with us. Um, the recording of this session can be found on the CIL Facebook page and it will be uploaded on the CIL webpage very soon. On our webpage, you can also find a bibliography with a number of useful materials related to the topics of the conference. So with this, we really hope to see all of you um, tomorrow again for the third session. Um, and with this, goodbye, good evening, or have a nice day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.